Begin in Philippians chapter 2. So if you will, uh, go ahead and stand to your feet. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read this together. And then I'm going to ask you to remain standing as we also read the scripture for our sermon today, okay? So beginning in Philippians 2 verse 1, it says this. If then there is any encouragement in Christ... Y'all can read with me. If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interests of others. Also, while you're standing, turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah. That is two books before the book of Matthew. Zechariah chapter 8. And that is where we're going to find our scripture for our sermon this morning. So the second to last book in the Old Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 8. The title of my sermon today is What We Believe About Our Participation in Society in Our Constitution. That's article number 18, titled Social Service. So what do we believe from a biblical perspective is the Bible's directive to us as we participate in our society? What is God calling us to do in society according to his word? So Zechariah chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 16. The Bible says this, these are the things you must do. Speak truth to one another. Make true and sound decisions within your city gates. Do not plot evil in your hearts against your neighbor. And do not love perjury. For I hate all this. This is the Lord's declaration. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for your word, that it is the unchanging, immutable, eternal word, God, that it is our standard, our foundation of truth, that it is ultimate transcendent truth, and all other uh, statements and all other information must be filtered through your truth, whether or not we can determine that it's truth or a lie. So God, today we look forward to hearing what you have in your word about your uh, mandates and your commands to us in terms of how we are to participate in our society, what you've called us to do, Lord, as we live among people and among uh, neighborhoods of people who may not know you, who may not value the same things that we do. Help us, God, to be true to your word and your word alone, not true to ourselves, not true to our own truth, but to your truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in our Constitution, article number 18 is titled Social Service. And this is what it says. Every Christian is under obligation to seek to make the will of Christ dominant in his or her own life and in human society. To oppose in the spirit of Christ every form of greed, selfishness, and vice. To provide for the orphaned, the widow, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. To seek to bring industry, government, and society as a whole under the sway of the principles of righteousness, truth, and brotherly love. To promote these ends, Christians should be ready to work with all men of goodwill and any good cause, always being careful to act in the spirit of love without compromising their loyalty to Christ and his truth. All means and methods used in social righteousness among men must finally depend on the regeneration of the individual by the saving grace of God in Christ Jesus. If you see those scripture references there with article 18, Zechariah chapter 8 verses 16 and 17 are stated there as support for our stance on what God has called us to in our participation in our society. Now, I don't think it's wise to ever just go in and take out a couple of verses from any book of the Bible uh, and try to make them uh, position themselves for a, a, a view that I may have or a view that our church may have, may have. So when we think about that, we need to make sure we take into context these two verses in the book of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was written to the Jews who were rebuilding the temple after the Babylonian captivity. Zechariah was busy encouraging them not to stop, but to continue until the temple was completed. Now, if you think back in your timeline of history with the nation of Israel, you have Israel as a monarchy with Saul, David, and Solomon. And then after Solomon, the nation divided into two, the northern 
northern kingdom Israel, the southern kingdom Judah. And after the extent of all of those king, kings and, and the two kingdoms, we have the Babylonian Empire that comes in and destroys Judah, destroys the temple, and then takes the best of the Israelites back to Babylon and holds them in captivity for 70 years. Well, after that 70-year period, God bends the heart of the king of Persia and causes him to desire to send the children of Israel back to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and to rebuild their temple. And on the course of rebuilding their temple here, they have some opposition that comes against them. The, the society and the culture that they find themselves in begins to push against them and begins to try to scare them into stopping what God had called them to do, which was to rebuild the temple. They had built some of it back at this point, but they stopped because they got scared. They thought, you know what? Society and those enemies around us are trying to quieten us, so maybe we should be quiet. Maybe we should just step aside and stop building the temple for now. Well, we find that Zechariah and even Haggai were called by God, men of God, prophets of God, to speak truth into the children of Israel post-exilic who were in Jerusalem to encourage them, don't stop doing what God has called you to do. Don't let society, don't let the forces that be, don't let the peripheral ideas come in and push you and, and frighten you and scare you into not doing what God has called you to do. In Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 through 5, here we have kind of an understanding of this. Now if you want to try to get the books of the Bible categorized in your mind in terms of when the events took place, remember the Bible is not in chronological order, which means it isn't, the books are not in order based upon when the events in those books actually happened. They're actually categorized by genres. So you have the major prophets, the minor prophets, you have poetry, you have wisdom, you have all these different genres. So if you'll take Ezra and Nehemiah, which is much earlier in the Old Testament in terms of where it is in your Bible, and you take Haggai and Zechariah, these two are taking place at the same time. So Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying during the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay, so in Ezra 4, 1 through 5, we get a little bit of an idea about what's going on in the time of Zechariah as he's making these prophecies to the children of Israel. It says this beginning in verse 1, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the family heads and said to them, let us build with you, for we also worship your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of King Haddon of Assyria, brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other heads of Israel's family answered them, you may not have part with us in building a house for our God, since we alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people who were already in the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. You hear that? The enemy, society, is making them afraid to build and do what God called them to do. Verse 5, they also bribed officials to act against them, to frustrate their plans throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia and until the reign of King Darius of Persia. You know, as we think about what's going on here in these days of Zechariah, as he's prophesying and encouraging Israel, don't stop doing what God has called you to do, we see that Christians in modern day America are doing the very same thing. As society ramps up the name calling and as society ramps up the pressure against Christian ideas and biblical virtues, Christians are becoming more and more silent. In our society, as God has called us to not just be in society, but to transform society through the gospel, Christians nowadays have decided that the the, the, the path of peace and the path of quietness and the path of just let be what is, is reigning supreme in the Christian churches. And what we're finding is, is that society is taking that vacuum of morality and they're filling it full of godlessness. They're filling it full of perversion. They're filling it full of demonic ideas and principles. All the while, Christians are sitting in their pews, doing their thing, serving on their committees, and letting the world do what it does. Well, today, God has not called us to be silent. 
God has called us to speak the truth one to another. So as we see here in Zechariah, we're going to see two different things in these two verses in chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Number one, we're going to see a command that God gives the children of Israel and by principle gives us. And then we're going to see a reality. And both of these are in conjunction with our consideration of influencing our culture and society with the gospel. So number one, let's talk about this command that God has, has in verse 16. What we must do. Now, a command is not a suggestion. A command is not something that, well, if you feel like it, if it feels good, if it's convenient, that's not anything to do with a command. A command is do this. And it is an objective command. It is a command that says, do this regardless of the circumstance. Do this regardless of the situation. Do this regardless of the popularity of what you have to say. Do this. And here we see in verse 16 of Zechariah 8, God says this through the prophet Zechariah, these are the things you must do. Did you hear that? These are the things you must do. Speak truth. To one another. Now that's a mouthful right there. I mean, we can talk about that statement for days and days and days. Speak truth to one another. He goes on down and he elaborates make true and sound decisions within your city gates. Do not plot evil in your hearts against your neighbor and do not love perjury. God hates lies, God loves the truth. Now, the reason he brings up city gates here is because in uh, the Middle East, whenever a, a town or a city was to govern itself and organize itself, the city gates were where all of the business would be handled. Whether it was governmental business, whether it was private business and people buying and selling land, making deals to one another, but also the moral judgments that had to come from the town elders. In other words, if someone is caught stealing, then they were tasked with convicting that person of stealing. Here, Zechariah is encouraging the post-exilic Israelites as they are in their city rebuilding the temple. Hey, you need to turn from your wicked ways. You need to speak truth to one another. You need to make sound and righteous judgments. You need to stop plotting evil in your heart against others because God hates those things. And there's an encouragement there to speak the truth. Now, the question in our society today is what is truth? Can you really know truth? Is there an actual truth that is knowable? Or is truth really based upon your idea of truth? How you feel or what you think truth is? Well, the Bible does not embrace a relative truth that's changing dependent upon circumstances or dependent upon the individual who has that belief. The Bible speaks of a truth that is unchanging, that is objective, no matter what happens, no matter who it involves, no matter how much time goes by, no matter what society says, the truth of Scripture is a foundational, objective truth that is never, ever changing. Well, how do we know that? Because Jesus said it. Jesus said in John 17, 17, as he's praying to the Father for the disciples, sanctify them by the truth, he says to the Father. Your word is truth. Wow. Speak truth to one another. This is something you must do. Well, God, what is truth? Right here. This is the truth. So you we know what God's telling us? He's saying if you don't want to plot evil in your hearts against others, but instead you want to love others, speak truth to one another. And you may say, well, Ben, people don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear that they're living in sin. People don't want to hear when, when, when you say, listen, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is going to hurt you. They don't want to hear that. But remember, the, the command is not a command that adds on these different caveats. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say, speak the truth to one another if they want to hear it. Speak the truth to one another if they agree with it. No. Speak the truth to one another. And he's putting that in opposition to plotting evil in your heart against other people. So if the opposite of plotting evil in your heart against other people is speaking the truth, then speaking the truth must be love. It must be loving to do that. And we live in a society where we want to pat people on their back in their sin because we think we're loving them. When we do that, we're actually not loving them. We are hating them. 
Because we're saying it's okay if you die in your sin and go to hell. We're okay with you dying in your sin. Just keep it up. But the Bible says to speak the truth to one another is to say you must be born again. You must be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You must repent of your sins. The message of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Don't keep living how you've always lived. Don't keep living and embracing your wickedness and your sin. I'm not okay with you living in your sin. I hate when people say that. Well, they can do whatever they want to do. It's their business. No, I'm not okay with that. I don't want to see them die and go to hell. Well, whatever they do in their four walls of their homes, okay with me. It's not okay with me. I don't want them to die and go to hell. What is wrong with the church where we've taken this path of neutrality? Neutrality is not an actual thing. Jesus even said, you're either for me or you're against me. Quit taking the path of neutrality and the path of silence. Either you're going to speak the truth to one another out of love or you're going to be quiet as people die and go to hell. Pick it. Choose. And I would be very concerned if you claim to be born again and a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ and you be able to sit and do and go through the motions while people are dying around you. Well, Ben, I just don't want to offend them. Hey, you know what? He didn't say, tell them if they want to hear it. He said, tell them. Hey, listen, there's a couple of different ways people are going to respond to us when we tell them the truth. Absolutely no doubt. In Romans 12, 21, the Bible says this, do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Well, we know good is telling the truth one to another. Now, in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, we have the story of Stephen. Stephen was one of the great original seven deacons. And Stephen is preaching to a group of people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and there's great conviction in his message. His message is not one where he's, he's, he's just rubbing their hair and, and soothing them. But he is bringing the convicting power of the Holy Spirit upon them through the truth of the events of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what their response to him was? Acts 7, 54. When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. You know what? God didn't say, Stephen, they're not going to like that. You need to back off. Speak the truth. And you know what Stephen was willing to do? He was willing to speak the truth, and he was willing to give his life for it. He was willing to give up his comforts, his luxuries, his materialism, his consumerism, whatever else he thought was most important in life. He was willing to lay all that aside and love his neighbor and tell them the truth. They didn't want to hear it, did they? In Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 18, we have a man named Herod. Many of you know this name as we talk about Christmas stories and the fact that Herod was opposed to Jesus, the king of the Jews. And John the Baptist was someone who didn't really uh, uh, pull punches. I mean, he was one of these guys who, who he laid the truth out for you. If you liked it, fine. If you didn't like it, fine. And Jesus, and Jesus even said that there was no prophet as great as John the Baptist. And this was how John did it. He spoke the truth to one another. Now, there was a problem with what Herod was doing in the life that he was living. He had actually committed adultery with his brother's wife. And they came together and got married. Well, John wasn't going to stand by and see that immorality happening without speaking into it. In, in that, those verses, it says, For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herodias his brother Philip's wife, whom he was committing adultery with, because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. They may say, Ben, I'm sure Herod didn't want to hear that. No, he didn't. Because we know what happened to John, don't we? Not only was he imprisoned and chained, but eventually he was beheaded. He was telling the truth. And what he told to Herod, what he was preaching was the most loving thing that he could have done. Because it was giving the truth to a man who needed to hear the truth, regardless of how it was re received. But you know, there's always those times too, though, when you share the truth with someone and they're thankful and they're joyous. There was a man named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He was a Gentile. And to this point, the Gentiles were not being saved. It was only the Jews that God was dealing with up to this point. 
And Cornelius, being a, a, a Gentile, had had dreams about, uh, about the true God, about people coming to him and telling him about who the true God is. And this was what he said whenever the apostles came to share the gospel with him in Acts chapter 10, verse 33. He said this, so I immediately sent for you. In other words, when he had the vision, he immediately sent for these men. And it was good of you to come, he said. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. You know what Cornelius was saying? I'm so thankful that somebody decided to come my way and tell me the truth so that I can be saved. So that I can know not only the truth, but the giver of all truth, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, you're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to encounter these different uh, ways that people are going to receive the truth. People are going to hate you for it. Some people are going to love you for it. But my friends, we don't tell the truth for popularity. This isn't about getting likes on Facebook. This isn't about how many people are going to watch our Instagram stories. We live in a society where we want instant popularity. We want instant uh, people just receive me and, and, and like me. Hey guys, if you're living life and you are basing your joy on how many likes you get on a post, my friends, you are living an empty, shallow life. You're living a life that will never produce what you are wanting it to produce. You're living a life that at the end of the day, you're always going to be frustrated. You're always going to be hating yourself. You're always going to be trying to get more and more and more, and it's never going to satisfy or fulfill your needs. The Bible says, speak the truth to one another, regardless of how it's received. And if we do that, we actually are loving our neighbors. I went on a mission trip to South Africa back in 2007. And during this trip, we ministered at a nursing home. Now, when I'm talking about a nursing home in South Africa, I'm not talking about Pisgah Manor or the Laurels at Green Tree. I'm talking about a subhuman condition type place. I'm talking about a place that you would not send your worst enemy. People laying in their own bodily fluids for hours and hours and even days. People dying in their room and no one knowing they're dead until two or three days later. These are the kind of conditions that these people were experiencing. And as we went in, we wanted to congregate all of the people, as many as we could, into one place so that we could share the gospel with them. Well, as we were going through this nursing home, there was a man sitting in the floor in one of the rooms. And we noticed that he didn't have any legs. That basically his way of mobility was just scooting around on his bottom, on his nubs, and trying to get around the best that he could. So we picked him up, we took him to the common area along with everyone else, and we began to share the gospel. Later on, this man told us that he had had a dream that God was going to send some foreign people to his nursing home and share with him the truth about who God is. And that day, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He was excited that the fact that somebody came and brought the truth to him. My friends, listen, do not let the way the world perceives you determine whether or not you're going to obey the commands of God. Quit letting society scare you into forgoing the call that God has laid on your life. Because if you're a believer, God has called you to tell the truth to one another. Not only is there a command there that we see in these verses in Zechariah, but we also see a reality of who God is, what God does. And we see that in the second part of verse 17. It says this, For I hate all this, this is the Lord's declaration. So here God is saying, speak the truth to one another. Quit lying in court. Quit giving uh, ungodly and unjust judgments to people. Quit, quit plotting evil in your heart against those who are your neighbors and those you're supposed to love. And then he rounds it up and says, I hate all this. And then we think, well, wait a minute, Ben. Isn't God a God of love? Absolutely. Absolutely. 1 John 4, 8, God is love, but God also hates. There are things that God righteously hates. And if God hates them, then we should hate them as well. You may say, well, Ben, I thought hate was bad. It's wrong, right? Listen, hate is necessary because sin exists. And if sin exists, we must hate sin. The Bible teaches us for the wages of sin is death. We think about drug addiction. We think about people who families are torn apart because of adulterous relationships. 
We think about people who give their bodies to multiple people before marriage and what they're left with is just a torn and tattered life with no emotion left. We think about the fact that, that people in our society are trying to change their genders and are trying to embrace ungodly ideas of morality because they're trying to embrace and get to some sort of happiness. God hates all of that. That is against the created order. That is against the giver of truth, the arbiter of truth, the transcendent God who is qualified to give truth. It is in rebellion against him. God hates all of those things. I wanna show you a picture here on the screen and I'm gonna read it to you because I know there's a glare, but this is our neighboring church and what it says is Jesus had two dads and turned out fine. Happy Father's Day to all fathers. Now, this was put up during Pride Month in June. Uh, this is our neighboring church here, Snow Hill United Methodist. And this is a prime example of God's apparent people embracing society and forgoing the word of God. I mean, essentially what's happened is, is they've taken this, which Jesus said, God's word is truth, and they found the nearest trash can and they've dropped this in it. And they said, we're gonna embrace humanism. We're gonna embrace the lust of mankind. We're gonna embrace the Romans one man who forgoes the glory of the creator for the creation, who worships the creation over the creator, who embraces lust over righteousness. We're gonna embrace that doctrine. You may say, well, Ben, why are we talking about this today? Because when, our, when people in this community were driving by that sign, people who knew nothing of Christianity, they were being deceived by a false doctrine. They're being deceived by a lie. And we don't love our community unless we stand against this kind of garbage. We don't love people up Milk Sick Cove and Hooker's Gap and Kathy Road and Dogwood Road and Bryson Road unless we speak against the godlessness that's coming from places that claim Christianity who have a cross on the building, who say the name Jesus and who say the name God. My friends, I would question if anyone up there has ever been born again. To sit under the godless false doctrine and heresy that's being put out is wrong. And today, if we're gonna speak the truth, we're gonna speak the truth whether people like it or not. Because at the end of the day, it is not up to me to determine how that truth is being received although I do need to be loving and kind, but it is up to the Holy Spirit to take that truth and to take it into the inner parts of that person's soul and change their life. But Romans 10 says that they're never gonna change unless they hear the gospel. How can they hear without someone to preach? How can they hear without someone to give them the truth? Tell the truth to one another, as God said through Zechariah there in the Bible. So we have to understand that churches that do this are churches that are propagating humanism and the ideologies of society. And that's why those churches are dying today because they don't have the power of God anymore. And it's not a competition between churches. But my friends, if you forgo the God of the Bible and the God who created the universe, then you can't expect the God of the Bible and the God who created the universe to bless godlessness. It's not gonna happen. And if you're, if you're expecting him to bless godlessness, then you're gonna be waiting for a very, very long time. It is hateful, it is mean to tell people that they can live in a homosexual relationship and be right with God. It is hateful and it is mean to tell someone who lives in a homosexual relationship that they'll go to heaven if they continue to embrace their sin. That, my friends, is hateful and wrong. We need to love people enough to say, God's got something better for you. God made you for something better. And God does not want you to be destroyed by your lust and by your sin. So we go on down here and we're going to see a little video here. If you will, guys, go ahead and play our video for us. Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the eighth quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. 
I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. All right, so that's what's called the Sparkle Creed. Now, this is a church that claims to be a Christian church. As you heard, they said that our God is non-binary. He had two daddies. Um, his pronouns are blankety blank whatever. And what they're doing is, is they're taking the God of heaven and they're making him into a, a, a piece of illustration to propagate lies and sinfulness. My friends, that's not a Christian church. And that woman there that's pro propagating these lies is gonna stand before a holy God one day. She's gonna be judged for what she's done. And all the other people that propagate such lies that do harm to humanity are gonna stand before God, the God who is love, but also the God who hates unrighteousness. And they're gonna be cast into a place called hell and he's gonna say, depart, I never knew you. You embraced the word of humanism, you embraced the word of society, you allowed the pressures of society dictate truth and you have forgone the truth of the word of God. My friends, judgment is coming for these people. Judgment is coming. And I am not gonna stand by and let Pole Creek go to sleep while people are dying and going to hell. It would be absolutely wrong for me as your pastor to be okay with the status quo, to be okay with us just lulling ourselves to sleep. Hey, listen, we live in a society that is run by materialism. We live in a society that is run by consumerism. You say, Ben, I don't have idols in my house that I fall down and worship. No, but do you worship the dollar? Do you worship your trips to the mall? Do you worship your vehicle? Do you worship your career? Do you worship your 401k? Hey, would you be willing to rock the boat at work when injustice is being done, possibly risking losing your job to do what's right? I think there's a lot of people who would pick their career over the righteousness of God. Because we live in a society where we have determined that our comfort is the most important thing. That our bank account is the most important thing. And as long as we're comfortable in our materialism, then everything else can just kind of be let go. We gotta quit that. We gotta put God back on the throne. We gotta say, God, what do you want me to do? What is your calling in my life? And God, whatever that calling is, I will pursue it with everything in me regardless of the consequences. Regardless of the reaction that I get from other people, I'm going to go with you, Lord. And I would much rather please you, God, than to please man. Think about this. God hates lies. God hates that little boys and little girls are being mutilated at the altar of transgenderism. God hates that men and women are giving their bodies to people they're not married to. God hates that babies are being murdered in their mother's wombs. God hates that children are abused. God hates that women are abused. God hates when people stand behind the pulpit claiming to preach the word of God and instead preach heresy and wickedness. God hates the injustice of our society in that pedophiles are protected while it is acceptable to sexualize our children through drag queen story hours. Those are things that God hates. And what's God ta told us to do? Has he told us to keep our religion private and stay within the four walls of the church? No, he's saying, go into your community, go to the city gates, go to the neighborhood meetings, the community gatherings, the football games. When you're walking down the road with your neighbor, go into those places and speak the truth. Take our society, understand that our society is our responsibility. Quit complaining about the condition of our society and go into it with the mandate that God has given us and speak the truth to one another. My friends, if you want the church to see revival, it's got to start right there. It's got to start with a group of people who are no longer spineless, no longer caving to the pressures of society, who are people like Zechariah, who are people like John the Baptist, who say, regardless of the reception that I get, I'm going to be about the calling that God has laid on my life. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 say this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. And we can stop right there and just think about that for a minute. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hear that? For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions, materialism, is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. Hey, you know what? Zechariah found himself in a situation where he was among people who had caved to the pressures and had been quiet. And Zechariah was called by God to go in and encourage them to stand up and speak the truth and continue forward in the calling that God had laid on their lives. You know what the product of Zechariah's obedience was? Ezra 5, verses 1 through 2. But when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, and Jeshua, son of Jozadak, began to rebuild God's house in Jerusalem. The prophets of God were with them, helping them. They quit taking the break. They quit caving to the pressures and they said, all right, let's get to work. All right, let's change the world. All right, let's go and do what thus says the Lord and quit doing what thus says society. Pole Creek, that's my challenge for you today. Hey, if you've gotten comfortable, get uncomfortable. Hey, listen, if you've you've started being okay with the atrocities that are going on in our society, the dehumanizing and devaluing of human life, if, you're, if, you're, if you've come to a place where you're okay with the, the biblical family being ripped to shreds and children growing up in fatherless and single parent homes because no one cares about the, the created order of how God made man and woman, if, if you've become okay with that, listen, today you need to go before the Lord. You say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not hating what you hate. If we love those in our community, we will speak the truth to them. If we hate them, We'll pat them on their back as they go in eternity of hell. You might be here this morning, you say, Ben, I've never accepted Jesus. What is the gospel? The gospel is the fact that God became man. God took on human flesh. Jesus lived a perfect life of 33 years. He willingly died on the cross. He he rose from the dead. Death did not defeat our Savior. He took our place. He is our substitute. He is our atonement. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we can have eternal life if we repent and turn from our sin and turn to him based upon his finished work on the cross. If you've never done that today, today's the day. The altar's gonna be open. We want you to come to know Christ today. We don't want you just to come to Pole Creek and hear a sermon and hear some songs. But if you don't know Jesus, today is the day. The Bible teaches now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Repent and believe today. Let's pray. God, I love you. And Lord, I am thankful for your goodness and your grace. I'm thankful for the truth. I'm thankful that the truth is not a mystery, but the truth is objective and it has been revealed. It has been revealed in the perfect, infallible 66 books of the Holy Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all of which are equally inspired by the Holy Spirit through men of old who penned these wonderful, great words that have been preserved for us today. So God, as we seek to love people, the opposite of plotting evil in our hearts against them. Lord, we understand that your idea of loving is telling the truth to one another. Help Pole Creek, Lord, not to be silent like these churches around us. Help Pole Creek not to be okay with lost souls dying and going to hell. Help Pole Creek not be okay with sin ruining and destroying the people in our community. But Lord, help us to be a people who goes into society and with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit sees society transformed, sees souls saved, sees hearts and minds renewed. God, help us to be a church that takes responsibility for the souls that live within our community. God, today we entrust the call that you have upon us into your hands. Help us, Jesus, to not quit when it gets hard, but help us to keep moving forward so that souls might be saved. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.